Namespaces are a killer feature in Logsy and they can transform the way you work within it. My name is Aryan and in this video I'll be introducing you to the concept of namespaces in Logseq and teaching you how to get the most out of it. I'll be walking you through my workflow and give you tips and tricks that will apply to almost every use case you can think of. Now this will be a comprehensive video and it may be a bit long so you don't have to watch all of it especially if you're not new to Logseq and have been using it for a while. But I'll anyways leave timestamps down in the description so that you can easily walk around and just check out the parts that interest you the most. Although I do recommend not missing the tips and tricks section. There will be something in that for everyone. Let's start off with order namespaces. I like to think of namespaces as a way to sort of create order in the chaos of tags. Now generally there's thought to be two primary organizational paradigms. One is the hierarchical note-taking paradigm of Rome Research or what Logsy typically identifies with where connections are made primarily with tags, there isn't really a concept of folders. While on the other hand, there's a more traditional hierarchical uh, note-taking structures. Now, apps that use the structure are Evernote, OneNote, you know, the general traditional kinds. Even pen and paper typically falls under this category. Both of these approaches have their own benefits and downsides, and most apps fall under one of these categories. Now, Logseq is primarily a bottom-up or tag-based sort of application where connections are primarily made to through tags. I'll link to a video here if you're interested in learning more about it, but I'll get back to namespaces now. So like I mentioned, namespaces are a way to create order in the chaos of tags. Now, how exactly does this work? Essentially, namespaces allows you to sort of make a page a subpage of another. Alright, so there's four primary cases where I'd use namespaces. First is to enable inheritance. Second is if you have maybe two or more pages with similar names. Third is as a way to sort of categorize and get a visual look at the category, as well as finally to segregate and separate pages into their own distinct sections. Now, of course, these four categories aren't set in stone and there's like a pr pretty good amount of carryover between each of these categories, but I've tried my best to separate them into four distinct. So let's start with inheritance. All right, so let's say I've got a page about a book called say The Daily Stoic. So this page will consist of all the highlights that are made from that book. And now let's say one day I decide to watch Tiago Forte's videos and realize I should probably remix my content. Maybe I should create a blog post or a newsletter issue about this book and some of my favorite messages from it, right? So now, how would I go about this? So one potential solution is to add a section somewhere down on this page. But now, obviously, this page is kind of a little bit huge, so I'm really not sure that adding more stuff to this already massive page is the best idea, right? So now, what's the other option? So maybe create a page called the, the article on the Daily Stoic. But the issue here is that I genuinely believe that this page should still fundamentally exist as part of the previous page, the Daily Stoic page. But now how would I sort of handle this case? I mean, sure, we could just name it article or book review or something on the Daily Stoic and then maybe a link, I guess, to the Daily Stoic page, or maybe have like a relates to property, property. But as you can see, these probably isn't. It, it feels like there's something missing with this, right? So, what can you do to like make this like a first class child, essentially, of the previous page? And this is where namespaces come in. Right, now to create a namespace, it's very simple. So you simply create command K, like you know, the way you normally create a new page, you can also create one through an inline link or something. But you literally just created using the daily stoic slash blog post. And boom. You've brought another page and there are a few special things about this page that you would notice. The first is obviously this tile property. But I'll just, yeah, so I'll just delete this. So what else do you notice about this page, right? Uh, seems regular, nothing at the top, nothing here, and hmm, what's this? 
hierarchy. I wonder what this means. And if you see here, you see a bullet point called the Daily Stoic. And if I click that hierarchy, it takes me back to the Daily Stoic. So I guess that's one way to that the relationship can be expressed because, well, now you can see the previous page and here, but it still feels like there's something missing, right? Like, how would you know that this page is connected to that page? Like previously, like even with the, if you had used the article about page, you'd only see like a linked reference, right? But now what's special about this is that there's an entirely different section called hierarchy, right? And now we've, and now we've got a hierarchy and what's special about this hierarchy is that it essentially shows that the blog post is a descendant of the daily story. Now, I really do not want to keep all this stuff here and I'm actually going to use the block to page plugin, which I'll just show you. So I'm just going to first indent everything under that block, right? And then tab and all right, great. It's indented. I'll right click the block and Click turn into page and boom. Now you've got a page called the Daily Stoic Highlights, right? Awesome. And I have once again this title property and you can see all the highlights are on this page. All right, now this definitely really declutters the original page and here's what's special. Now, as you can see in the hierarchy, in addition to having the blog post, you see the relationship of the highlights page as well. These are both inheriting from the Daily Stoic page. And if you go on to the blog post page, well, you only see the Daily Stoic because the blog post is only a child of the Daily Stoic. And now the way that I'd approach this workflow is that I'd have the Daily Stoic as sort of like the central page of the Daily Stoic book. So I'll just have, as you can see, a quick summary. And over here, I'll essentially have whatever I want to see from the tooltip when I hover over this page will be shown here. So I'm just like randomly typing and I see a daily stoic. So I just hover over it. And what I expect to see or what would be relevant to me in that time is just this quick synopsis that and I might just add a 365 uh, page 365 chapters, one for every day. Awesome. And now this is really all the information that I want to see when I hover over this page. Now, a lot of, there's lots of other cool stuff about this. Now, this would essentially allow you to have multiple uh, blog post pages. Like let's say you only want a blog post about one specific thing. So uh, let's say I only really need a blog post like, cause this book is too massive to divide into just a single blog post. So I'll have blog post part one and I'll go back blog part one as you can see here but and I can also create now a page called blog post part two right so blog post part two um, about fear maybe now you're back in the daily stoic and you can see this two uh, blog post sections right so now at this point what I can do now is go even a step further and actually just rename these pages to blog post slash uh, I don't know maybe fear right and I'll go here and rename this blog post to about duty maybe and now if I go back to the page you notice that there's actually a third hierarchy blog post and and now if you go into this blog post page you'll see that there is uh, it has children for about duty and about fear and this is pretty pretty big and Definitely one of the best use cases that I've seen is just to be able to just go into the blog post page and easily see all the blog posts that have to do with it. And this is similar, I guess, to the the map of contents in Obsidian, the entire method of map of contents. And this can be replicated using namespaces. And this allows you to have essentially multiple review pages as well while still keeping each a blog post slash review separate and while still being connected to the initial book. This directly bridges into the next use case, which is naming and differentiating repeated pages. Let me explain. So using the previous model, you essentially have a bunch of review pages and these show up on the source page as just blog posts, but they're interestingly linked to the parent followed by the child or the daily story slash blog post. This means you can have multiple review pages in your database and they all appear on the source as just review 
and they can be referred to and exist as separate pages. For instance, I, I can actually create a separate page called about duty. And this exists separately to this page. And that's really the core of this message. You can have different pages for one topic, but they're only differentiated by their namespace. So I can have like maybe blog posts and this post exists separately from the daily story. So I could just have like a plain old blog post page. But I also have the daily story slash blog post and this relates directly to the daily story. But perhaps the best application for this is in programming notes. So I'll actually just go there and go to my programming notes right now. So normally when you're learning programming languages, a lot of the concepts are fundamentally the same. Well, at least in name. So functions, for instance, right? It's probably there in every single programming language has some concept of function. One option is just create a plain page called functions, right? You probably want to differentiate between functions in different languages. Like functions in Clojure are different from functions in JavaScript. They behave differently. They, they are typed differently. And when I'm like, just generally, if I come across an interesting application of functions in my day to day life and I write about it in the journal, I want to be able to distinguish which kind of functions I'm talking about. So the way I take to programming notes involves me having a page for every single high level language or framework. So for instance, I have pages for Swift, I have pages for JavaScript, I have pages for Python, I have pages for C, I have pages for Clojure. So I have all of these. So now let's say I take a few notes on how to define a function in Swift. So how I do it is I start off with a link to the Swift slash functions page, right? So, and under this, I'll indent uh, defined via the syntax. And over here, I'll write the syntax or something. So Swift, right? And this, I'll just have it here as my, as one of my notes. So now let's say later in the next week, I'm learning about uh, Python and specifically I'm covering Python functions. So I, in this case, create a page called Python functions, which I already have. And under this, I'll indent like similar things about how to define. Uh... Now looking back at what I've done, you will see that I've essentially covered two very similar programming concepts, but I've put them into their own pages based on their specific nuance. So what's even cooler is how when I go into the Swift page, like just a plain old Swift page, right? Let's say I look down and I can see like literally every single hierarchy, okay? Every single hierarchy that I have, I can like see which, what over what, I can see my pages for each concept. I can easily get a bird's eye view on each concept and understand how I can. And I can see that everything's just organized into such a nice list and there's inheritance and it's a nice experience. And now this may sound familiar to people who've used Evernote or OneNote or another note taking tool in that vein, because this is essentially a list illustrating the hierarchy of a note, but combined with the power of log C can lead to, lead to a sort of best of both worlds. So you can still use all your log C features. You can still heavily link and embed data in different places, but you'll also be able to get the benefit of having say a separate database or in the case of OneNote or something, a separate folder or section for each of the Swift things, but still be able to like, you know, link in between it. So I can still link to uh, Python functions like in the Swift functions page. And I can still link to maybe both of those functions using uh, in the same page. And I'm not restricted by something like Evernote where each of these exist separately from each other. In addition to this, this use case also applies to things like general meeting notes, for instance. Let's say I've got a meeting with Bob from purchasing. Now, now I have a question. Would you double click and create a link to a page called purchasing? It's kind of a two way street. So sure, you would likely want to tag the department so you can easily corroborate all communications with that specific department, right? But I mean, just simply writing purchasing probably isn't going to help you very much specifically because let's say uh, I'm taking notes on the importance of purchasing uh, in a business, right? So now I've got a page called purchasing here and uh, I probably want to uh, create a link to a page called purchasing here as well. 
the issue here is that if I go to the purchasing page, I now have two different purchasing related things linked into it. So I have the purchasing department and I have the concept of purchasing in businesses. And so now you can see that I have like three different page links. Now this is obviously not ideal. What if I create something like importance of purchasing in a business? So instead of linking to the purchasing page, I'll link to business slash purchasing. And here I'll link to Acme slash purchasing. And here maybe I'll link to uh, groceries slash purchasing. Right? And I can probably delete this page now. But now what's essentially happening is that I've got three different pages called purchasing. And each of these pages are related to a specific branch, a specific use case of purchasing. So I can have uh, Acme slash purchasing, business slash purchasing, grocery slash purchasing. So growth, these are probably not the best examples, but they're just uh, good to illust illustrate what's happening here. And these become a lot easier to see at a glance, but also to de delineate between similar things. This third use case is once again similar to the previous one. Really, it's really just a way to get at a quick glance what a note is about. A common practice, and I'll actually show you this because I've been using this practice for a very long time. So a common practice is to prefix videos with V, articles with D, or courses with C, and so on, right? So as you can see, I've got, uh, maybe I've read, read an article. So I have A, so how to study, three popular revision techniques, right? So I have article notes over here, right? Ali Abdal, I believe he has a part-time YouTuber Academy course, but he also has an article called the Part-Time YouTuber Academy. So there's cases like this where there's a separate article and there's a separate course, but they all have the same name. In this case, I guess I would prefix them with A, right? Now, this is an example of a workflow that can be supercharged with namespaces. So by naming the page, for instance, let's say, uh, let's see if I have one for Atomic Habits, right? So I want it for B uh, dash under Atomic Habits. Right? Now, what if I were to rename this page to B slash Atomic Habits? So now what's special about this is that rather than having the B colon, when I go into the B slash Atomic Habits page, similar to the what we discussed previously, okay, it's kind of massive. At the bottom, you have this hierarchy called B. Now I can get a bird's eye view of essentially every single book over here while also having the prefixes that I was anyways going to use for this. So now rather than adding a special tag called, I don't know, type uh, book, I can literally just write B slash atomic habits or maybe book slash atomic habits or something like that. How cool is that? So another example of this, I guess, would be what if like, you were to blend it with the previous use case as well a bit. So what if I have apple, you know, the company and the fruit. So I can have fruit slash apple or company slash apple. All right, and this way I can also get my pages for every fruit and my page for every company. And all like apples, bananas, milk, or whatever I have. Well, not milk, milk's not a fruit. Apples, banana, carrots, no, carrots are vegetables. Okay, so whatever fruit is, will be uh, inherited from fruit, will go in the fruits page and the link references, and all companies will go on company. Now there is one more use case, and I think that this is one that really depends on your own workflows, and this is compartmentalizing the pages into their own sections. Now, this is essentially replicating a folder structure in LogSeq in its entirety without any changes. So now this is actually personally the approach that I take for my school notes. Normally for my school notes, what I start with off with my is physics page, right? Now I'll just show you my hierarchy. So as you can see here, what I've done is I've essentially sort of replicated what you'd expect with a simple like physical binder. So I have like maybe a section on my shelf called physics. And in that section on my shelf, I have all my physics related stuff. In that shelf, I have my textbook and binders for everything that I learned in my grade 10 maybe, right? And then in grade 10, I have my, in my grade 10 binder, I have sections for astrophysics, electromagnetism, thermal physics, etc. So now the advantage of this approach is that there's a clear delineation of its note into its own sections, which allows me to, at a glance, see everything inside one section. So all the, everything that comes under one section, everything that comes under grade 10 physics, for instance, 
or everything that comes under my classes, what I've learned in my external classes. Or maybe I think another better approach would probably be for my business notes. Those are probably a better example. So as you can see down here, everything that I've done is directly inherited from the grade 10 business studies as an individual section. But also, uh, for instance here, I've got my lemonade stand as the subpage of cash flow forecast as well. This is quite similar to some of the above, but in its purpose, but it's different enough that this method essentially embodies the traditional folder-based architecture while still preserving the atomicity of the information. So as you can see here, I've got maybe, maybe if I go to my, uh, I don't know, uh, thermal physics page, or rather actually maybe my atomic physics page. It's from all over the place I've embedded things. So like nuclear physics, at atomic physics, and these are all in my, in this page, embedded into this block. And this is something that you won't really get with most traditional folder-based art folder-based structures, it allows you to have the best of both worlds. And this is probably the most true sense as it's literally folders. You're literally dividing them into folders, like sections, comic physics under grade 10 physics, and maybe you have a grade nine physics section as well. So, right, so everything's embedded inside that into its own separate place essentially, but it's still a part of the greater whole. It can still be linked from anywhere. It can still embed things from anywhere. It can still be made up of block embeds or references from other places in your database. And that's, in my opinion, pretty cool. Now, a lot of these four concepts share a lot in common with each other. Including the downsides. The first one's pretty obvious. They're long. Like, the page titles are just quite a pain to type out. Like, I mean, who's gonna really type out, uh, all right, physics, or rather, let's say business study. It's even longer, actually, so I'm just gonna go with, uh, business studies stash slash grade 10 business studies slash i don't know uh, uh income statements All right and do i really want to be typing this enormous link every time i type right and just in a practical sense are you ever going to use these links if they're just this goddamn long to type out and they're also very ugly when you're just linking to it. So like, I did performed a income statement analysis on company X. Like, really, why is the link taking up 70% of the words in the sentence? Yeah, so probably not ideal and it can be very unwieldy and it isn't really the ideal frictionless experience. And secondly, there's another concern, which is that this method of organization can at times force you into the type of rigidity that you might not actually want. And this is something that's true for all of the mentioned use cases. So what if you're not sure where something could go? What if you have a single interdisciplinary class on engineering taught by both your science and math teachers? Like, do you make a sentence section on engineering or put it into math or put it into physics section? How do you decide? Is the lecture already halfway done and you're still debating where to put your notes, right? <laughs> now, this is actually one of the problems that LogSeq aims to solve, but in this area, you're kind of getting stuck here. And I think you can see where I'm going. There's a chance that the friction coming from this can outweigh the benefits. And this is supposed to be one of the benefits of LogSeq. You don't have to think where to put your notes. And this will be something that will be incredibly personal towards you. So all of these above workflows may not work for everybody. Everyone, the workflow with the prefixes for videos are for instance, pretty usable generally for everyone. But the same cannot be said for categorizing the notes based on their overarching subject slash topic, which is gonna be more useful for students in my opinion. And like, for instance, like going back to the engineering example, like I have taken notes on engineering. So engineering taster session maybe, right? So I'm just taking notes here. Um, now, I know the last bit was a bit theoretical, and I myself probably jumbled things up a bit with, but that's because all of the functions are so interrelated that it's hard to create solid delineations when you implement one, so you usually benefit from the other one as well. So, let's have some fun now. Sure, all the applications of namespaces may not be too applicable for your use case, but there are some tricks that are almost universally useful. So the first two deal with the typically unwieldy nature of namespaces, usually by the virtue of its length. 
In order to make the namespaces look less messy, especially when your use case involves a lot of nested namespaces, such as my usage for studying, in order to make the namespaces look less messy, you can use the following custom.js script. Now, if you haven't used custom.js before, you know, the process is fairly simple and I'll walk you through it all. And I'll have the link to the custom.js script in the description as well. Right, so this, this is the script for the namespace optimizer and you can, this is actually by Cannibal Ox and it's part of his larger, his larger, this is part of his larger Bloxy custom files suite, which you can find over here. And this includes a, quite a few utilities that I thoroughly recommend. But uh, let's get back to this topic. So I've literally just forked it and I've just taken the namespaces prefix collapser just to make it easier for y'all. So now to install this into your Logseq instance, just click download zip file, uh, allow the download if you're in Safari, and then all you have to do is click into it. It will have a very weird name, but once you've got that, it should appear, and here it is. Right, so the next step is to quite literally just drag this file into your database folder, right? You, uh, you'll you see, wait, I'll just show you where the database is. So as you can see, test seek is over here, and which is the name of the database. And inside that, there's a bunch of five folders, which you're probably familiar with. And inside the log seek folder, you literally just drag this custom.js file and you're ready. So now when you return to log seek, re-index, and now you're boom. Now you're at your daily note page, and as you can see, all of your namespaces that were previously in this format are, have now been reduced to simple collapsed. And this just shows the last name while also having dots to signify that these are descended from others. So you can just create something else, even more. And as you can see from here, the namespace just keeps getting shortened and boom. And you can always, you know, just open the page, click it, and then maybe just return back and you can actually hover over it, I believe. And it'll show you the full title of the page. And this is pretty neat. And I thoroughly recommend this method for just keeping your namespaces much cleaner. Next is aliases, which is already one of the most powerful features of Logseq, but are especially useful when dealing with namespaces. And I've created an in-depth article about this topic as well, and a link to it will be in the description, I believe, if you want to read more. So the beauty of aliases is that they're another way to refer to a page. While the previous method deals primarily with the viewing of namespaces, via aliases, such as in this page, you will notice that there's two that there is an alias property over here. So as you can see, it says statements of financial position and balance sheets. Both of these are separated by a comma. So now what if I, and now if I go to the bottom, you can see that there's three linked references, right? But one very interesting thing that you'll notice all of a sudden is that some of these references, like this one, doesn't link to this very long name. I can also just go here and type uh, balance sheet. So now when I go to balance sheets, uh, it actually takes me to this page. And what's special about this is that it appears at the bottom as well as linked references. And this makes it so that you don't have to type the massive link every single time. And like even for this example, you can, this link over here, you could have just typed income statements and the link would still be counted because I've already created an alias in this page that leads to income statements. And I have more about this in the article, right? But there's also another way in like, let's say you see this big link right over here, right? I can just take out these brackets, uh, surround it in just brackets, add thing here. And over here you can add alias text, such, such as um, I see. I know that's not the full short form for income statements, but as you will see, you can actually link directly to this while maintaining the connection to there. And that's pretty cool. But I do thoroughly recommend the alias colon example as that allows you to like have it actually appear in autocomplete. And this is just sort of a visual. This whole thing radically simplifies the use of namespaces and makes it so that you can retain the structure of namespaces without maintaining the downsides of it. Now, another very nice feature to do with namespaces is the namespace query feature. But what I've essentially done here is that I've added this peculiar looking text. It just says namespace and then this is studies in some bracket, I guess. What this does is that it shows you every single item in the namespace, but it shows you that in hierarchy. It shows you what descends from which topic, the connection between all those, and 
this view is essentially what you'd see in like the sidebar of a note-taking app like Evernote or Obsidian, where you can see that the notes are in their own folders. But and this is quite literally just a way, way of viewing the notes in their in the folders. And a really neat thing about this is that you can quite literally put this query anywhere that you want. Some people just keep it in their contents page to create sort of a map of contents, I guess, just automatically generated. And that's just a very useful thing that not many people know about. Segwing from this, here's the tip about querying and linked references. So when you link to a page, like say, uh, yeah, I'll just create one link to this page. So now when you go to this page, like as you would expect, you would see this link up here at the bottom, right? But one very interesting thing is that the physics page will also have the page appear as a link. And it's the same with the grade 10 physics page. That will also appear right over here. And this is pretty cool because this unlocks a few possibilities, especially when you're using the other use cases, like for instance, for the daily story from previously, when you link to the daily story slash highlights, right? When you link to this page, you also link to the regular daily story page. And from there, you can easily see everything that has to do with the daily story, not just like the highlights of it or everything that has to do with the review. And it's acts as sort of a centralized repository of, and this will allow you to instantly sort through the references, which gives a ton of utility to the source page. And this relates well with almost all the above use cases actually. And the same logic can be applied to querying, where by querying for one page, you would also return all the results of the pages above it. So for instance, if I create a query for, uh, let's say, physics, it's not only the physics pages that will be returned, but also the links to the external places as well. So like astrophysics, the thermal physics, the, th the grade 10 physics, all this stuff will also appear in the query. Like if you combine it with the previous prefixing for like book and all, you can also just query for a book and all the books will show up. So finally, for those who are interested, I'm going to go into a bit of the behind the scenes and maybe a few technical details. So feel free to skip the section if you're not interested in knowing about this, but this will help you understand it and its limitations. So at its core, all namespaced files are stored in the same manner as regular files. They're just hanging out in the pages set folder. If I open this page using a open directory, what appears is this. So you've got the parent page and all the sub pages are separated by these percentage 2f, which is just Unicode because file systems do not really treat the slashes simply very well. And as a result, it's necessary that something like this be used. From version 0 0.6 to 6.8 onwards, this new percentage 2F URL encoding has been performed so that it is more steady and this will eliminate the need for the title property in the future. And this also unlocks the possibility for having dots in the title of your page. As this would previously create a namespace, as in prior versions, the file names had dots instead of the percentage 2F. Now, if you're into advanced queries, these are stored as regular pages in the database, but all of these are accessible via the, the block slash namespace property. So now I hope this, this video was helpful for you and it would help you kick off your journey with namespaces. It's a powerful tool and is one that I definitely think can add value to your setup. Thank you and until next time. You can see any additional videos if you'd like on the left and the right of the screen.